Everyone wants peace. There is good news. God promised to give us peace. In fact, God sent Jesus expressively for that purpose. That's why Christmas is a season focused on peace. We will find peace, not as the world gives, not even as a kind we might think we're looking for. But when we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we will find peace. Long ago, the prophet Isaiah proclaimed God's promise to send someone who would be the Prince of Peace. In Isaiah 9:6, we read, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. God fulfilled that promise. He sent us Jesus Christ, his one and only Son, into the world. He is the promised the Prince of Peace. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for keeping your promise and sending your Son, Jesus Christ, into the world. In him, we find our peace. Amen. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Now, just need to get you warmed up, practiced up for the next few next few days. It's good to see you. Glad that you're here. Thanks for coming out. It's snowing. I didn't bargain for that when I moved, but I, you know, you're kind of an idiot if you don't know that when you move to Ohio, you're going to run into some snow. So, I guess we'll have to deal with it. So good to see you. Hey, our um, our media people there for a moment were not experiencing any peace on the night, <laughs> weekend, we're going to talk about peace. You know what the international sign of a media worker at church is? <laughs> they just raise their hands and shake their heads because they don't know what in the world's going on. It is, uh, it is good to see you. I wanted to remind you uh, before we get into the message about our Christmas challenge. That uh, Our Christmas challenge is where we all uh, take a few dollars um, that we might use on ourselves or our family, and we donate it to a great cause. And this year that cause is Raising Arrows. It, um, it is a ministry, as some of you know, that many of our people are involved in, but it's a it's a ministry to the families who take in foster children and thereby extension a ministry uh, to those kids. And I've been thinking about the fact that uh, the Christmas story revolves around a baby that had no home. There was no room in the inn. And Raising Arrows revolves around a ministry that takes those kids in. Uh, kids who are struggling, kids who uh, uh, otherwise maybe have no place to go. And uh, so families in our area take them in. And Raising Arrows provides car seats and diapers and clothes and, and um, cribs and all of that. Our goal is $15,000. And uh, as of a few days ago, the report I got was, that so far we've raised about $5,300. So we've got a ways to go, and so you can give tonight, uh, you can give uh, tomorrow, you can give throughout this week, and certainly, certainly we hope uh, to raise a lot of money on Christmas Eve and on Christmas itself. Every donation matters, and by giving you're being a part, you're helping to be a part of helping uh, these families, but also... Uh, these kids. Well, I'd like, uh, I'd like you to join me in the scripture, if you will, and we're going to start in Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9, and uh, that, that verse was just read uh, for you a moment ago, but we're going to talk about peace, peace. All of us have areas of our lives from time to time where peace uh, evades us, eludes us. I, I heard about a guy uh, went to a doctor and, and said, Doc, he said, I'm, I'm just all tied up in knots all the time. I have no peace. And the reason is because I can't sleep. And uh, the doctor said, well, why can't you sleep? And he said, because every time I lay down, 
I feel like there's somebody under my bed. And, um, and it just makes me anxious and nervous and, and a little bit afraid. And, and he said, uh, so sometimes what I'll do is I'll get underneath the bed. I'll just sleep underneath the bed. Well, then when I do that, I think there's somebody on top of the bed. And I, I get all worked up. So the doctor said, well, I think I can help you. He said, it'll take two years, a couple of visits uh, every week for two years. It's going to cost you about $10,000. And the guy said, well, let me think about it and go home and talk to my wife. So he goes home and he takes, uh, talks to his wife and he calls the doc back. And he says, look, doc, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not going to take the treatments. I'm not going to come and see you. I, I think I've got a handle on this. And uh, after talking to my wife, she doesn't want me to do it. And the doctor said, okay, but what are you, what are you going to do? He said, well, my wife cut the legs off the bed. Now there can't be anybody underneath there. We're all trying to find a way to have peace. In the prophecy in Isaiah, where uh, maybe the most popular prophecy, where it talks about the coming of the Messiah, the Christ child, it says, for to us a child is born to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor. He will be called Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and his peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding with justice and righteousness from the time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And then in the Christmas story itself, the uh, priest Zachariah, who discovers that his wife, Elizabeth, is going to have a baby, and that this child is going to be John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus. In chapter 1 of Luke says, And you, my child, talking to John the Baptist, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare, prepare a way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of sins because of the tender mercy of God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death. Listen to this to guide our feet into the path of peace. Let's pray. Father, would you help us to hear the word of the Lord and to take seriously, Lord, tonight, this promise of peace. We pray it in the name of Jesus, your Son and our Lord. Amen. When I was uh, preparing to move, I, uh, <clears throat> I was going through my library and kind of deciding which books to keep and which books to take to the used bookstore and which books to give to other pastors. And as I was going through uh, hundreds of books, I, I came across a book that I'd read probably 30 years ago. I was a part of a book club at Georgetown College in Kentucky. And, and uh, the title of the book that still was on my shelf was Thriving on Chaos, Thriving on Chaos. It, was, uh, it is a book that was written by Tom Peters, who's kind of a business guru. And I, I, I just tell you, I have not been able to get the thought of thriving on chaos off of my mind. The, the world in which Jesus was born was a world of chaos. I mean, his very birth created enough chaos of its own. And yet it was a world that was politically bankrupt. It was a world that was spiritually struggling. It was a world of chaos. But the world in which we live trumps it about 10 times or 100 times. I mean, we, uh, we don't have to be convinced. None of us has to be convinced that we live in a world of chaos. There's anger and selfishness and mistrust and division. And that's not to mention the 
geopolitical crises or the economic chaos that we're facing and certainly not the social chaos that is so prevalent in our world. And I can affirm to you tonight that we also live in a time of theological chaos. And Christmas comes into this world of chaos and stress and difficulty and promises us peace. (laughs) Peace. The question is, where is peace? Where is this peace that Jesus has promised us? Where do we, are we to find it in all of this chaos? In fact, another question is, what is this peace? The Hebrew word used for peace, which is also used oftentimes in the New Testament, is, is the word shalom. Shalom... Um, it might be a familiar word to you, but it, it, it is a word that's oftentimes used peace. Some churches will have a, a time during their worship service where they'll pass the peace, and oftentimes people will use the word shalom. It, it is a greeting or a blessing of peace into someone's life. But like a lot of biblical words, it has a, it, it has a deeper meaning than just peace. It can mean harmony. It can mean wholeness. I I wish for you, I bless you with wholeness, completeness, welfare, tranquility. All of those are words that can be described as shalom. When I was doing my research this week, I I found a a number of commentaries, a a number of biblical scholars use the word or the, uh, the definition of peace as well-being, well-being. One, uh, one scholar intrigued me particularly, and I haven't found anything to, to disavow this definition. Somebody said that the word shalom means more than well, more than well, more than temporary, more than than shallow, more than just, I'm going to hang on by the skin of my teeth. This is more than well. Jesus is promised as one who will come into the world of our chaos, whether it's personal or community or cultural, and he wants to bring us peace. He wants to make us more than well. My goodness. I want to I want to think about that. I want to embrace that. I I want to understand that in this life and certainly in the life to come I can live in peace. And peace um, peace really is a bookend to the life and ministry of Jesus. He um, Zechariah says he's going to lead us in a path of peace. The prophet says that he will be the prince of peace. And then Jesus himself, at the end of his life, Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My my shalom I give to you. Not as the world gives, give I to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, neither let it be fearful. So from birth to death, And beyond, Jesus promises you and me peace more than well, more than just, uh, again, just something that that is a fleeting thing. Well, well, we're at peace right now, but, well, it won't be long. Something will happen. I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. I'm just waiting for somebody to do something stupid and cause me a lot of problems. That's not, that's not what Jesus promises. That's not what the Scripture promises. Jesus' birth offers to us peace that helps us to endure and to become victors and not victims, not just a means of hanging on 
but a, the ability to be more than well. I, uh, I think the Lord brings us peace in all kinds of forms and fashions. And I think like so many gifts of Christmas, we have to be willing to receive it and accept it and make it our own. Let me, let me just talk to you about some ways that Jesus wants to bring us peace. The first is this. Jesus wants us to have peace with God. Peace with God. I, I, know, I, I know we want to be able to handle our, our, uh, our finances and our health can cause chaos and, and our relationships with our family can create conflict. But can I tell you, the worst, the greatest, conflict in our lives is when we are out of step with God. When we are out of fellowship with him, when we are out of harmony with him, when we are living according to our own desires and our own will, all of that causes chaos and conflict in our lives. And, and I, would just, I would just say with all of the... Uh, passion and conviction that I can tonight, if you are out in conflict with God and out of peace with God, most of the rest of your life is going to be in conflict and chaos. The Bible says we all have been separated from God. At birth, we are separated from God. Now, I understand that nothing can separate us from the love of God. I understand. He loves us no matter who we are, where, we, where we've been, what we've done. He loves us. I understand all of that. I understand that he's pursuing us constantly. But there's always going to be a war between what his will is and our will is if we don't submit to his love and grace and mercy. If we don't believe in him, if we don't trust him, the Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it is that sin that causes separation from fellowship with him. And the Bible says puts us at odds with him. We're at odds with his love for us. We're at odds with his plan for us. And in that sense, in that very cosmic sense, there's a barrier between us and God. Look what Paul says, the Apostle Paul says about that. In Ephesians chapter 2, he says, For he himself is our peace. He has made the two groups one and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we have access to the Father by one Spirit. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Paul says Jesus came to reconcile us, to give us peace, to tear down the dividing wall. And his Holy Spirit accomplishes that in our lives. I, I, I'm excited to, to share with you today. There's multiple ways and multiple things that happen when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior that bring us peace. The first is forgiveness. He forgives us of our sins. That's exactly what Zacharias sang or said to John the Baptist, yet unborn, about why Jesus was going to come. He is coming to forgive us of our sin. A lot of us would like to deny that we're sinners <laughs> or we've sinned. 
We like to call it a mistake or a difficulty or a problem. But the reality is that Scripture calls it sin. It separates us from the Lord. But thanks be to God, He sent His one and only Son to give us forgiveness. Aren't you glad for that? Say amen. Amen. Forgiveness. The second thing I would just point out to you is that we have peace because he reconciles us to himself. He, we're no longer separated. We're no longer enemies. We're no longer at odds with God. But we, in fact, are reconciled to the point that he calls us sons and daughters and makes us joint heirs with Jesus Christ himself for all of the blessings of heaven. Thanks be to God for reconciliation. I don't have to be separate. You, 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 you know what it's like in other relationships when, when there's a wedge, when there's a gap, when there's a, uh, when there's a, a, a separation, and how wonderful it is when there's reconciliation. The third thing is sanctification. That's a word we don't uh, talk about enough, I don't think, in the, uh, from the Scriptures. But we are called biblically to be sanctified holy in Scripture. What's that mean? Well, it means that even though we've come to Christ and we've believed on Him for salvation and forgiveness, there still is this spiritual nature called the carnal nature, this nature that is at odds with God. And Paul says, I try to do what's right and I can't and I try to not do what's wrong and I keep doing what's wrong and it's because of that nature that wars against the will of God. But he has promised to fill us with his Holy Spirit that we not only are reconciled but we are filled with his, his essence, with, with the, the uh, Son of God. We're filled with the Holy Spirit so that no longer do I control my life but he controls my life. Simply put, there comes a time in our spiritual journey that creates conflict between my will, my agenda, my plans, my passions, my dreams, and those of the Lord. And there comes a time when I say to the Lord, I not only give you my sins, which is the bad stuff, but I give you the good stuff. <laughs> I give you my future. I give you, my, I give you control of my heart and life. I'll let you dictate and guide me for everything in my future life. Now, I know, I know what it's like to try to, to live with that conflict and, and try to say, well, I'm a Christian and I love Jesus and I'm living for the Lord, and yet I want to do my thing. I want to do my, I, I, I want to fulfill my dreams. I want to you know, all of that stuff. My, my, my. You're going to see that at Christmas, by the way. When you buy your grandson a gift that your granddaughter wants. Amen. I've seen it. We were going shopping yesterday, and we had to keep thinking. Now, should we really buy this for her? Because if we buy it for her, you know the other one's going to want it. And, and I said to Elan, it's not fair not to buy her something just because Somebody needs to spank the other one. Amen. But that's the kind of conflict we often have with God, unless we're willing to say, Lord, I give you everything. I give you everything. I give you my future. I give you tomorrow and the next day, and I give you all of my life. Thanks be to God. Thessalonians says, <clears throat> May God himself, the God of peace, the God of peace sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body, everything, be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I have, I have peace with God because he forgives me, he reconciles me, and he sanctifies me. The, third, or the second thing, the next thing, that I, I believe that he brings peace to us for, is so that I can be at peace with myself. Peace with myself. That's a big struggle, isn't it? It's a big part of our conflict. 
oftentimes our worst enemy is us. Our worst enemy to peace is us. And, and I just want to say, and I could li list a number of things here, but, but the Lord wants to bring peace to our past and peace to our failures and peace to our weaknesses, peace to my death. He wants me to have peace when, when that moment comes that, that I'm going to leave this earth. I, um, I'm like a lot of us, I, I, I get put out by the things I can't do. Or I get put out by the things I did do and I wish I could change. Or I get put out by the past that has so formed me and in many ways formed me in a bad way. The Lord Jesus wants us to let those things go. And he wants to give us peace. One of my weaknesses is I can't jump. Never could. And I don't think to have peace means I'm going to be able to dunk a basketball. But I do think that Jesus promises to remind me over and over again, it's not a big deal. Amen? Some of you need to seek the Lord of peace because of the conflict in your heart over things that have happened to you, things that you've done, things in your past, consequences that result because of that that are maybe never going to change. But ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know Jesus is a peace giver, and he will bring you peace and let you believe that he, you are worthy in his sight. He loves you, and you have great value, even in the midst of things that have gone wrong. I think of people like the woman at the well. A lot of failures. I think a lot about the woman who got caught in adultery. Wow, what a past. I, I think about uh, Stephen in the book of Acts who was stoned to death but, but died with great peace, saying like our Lord did, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. John... Uh, John 16, Jesus says this, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You may have peace. In this world, you'll have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Isn't that good news? Thanks be to God. Well, I've got to hurry. Let me just say uh, the third thing that the Lord does in giving us peace is he helps us to have peace with our neighbors and our enemies. With our neighbors and our enemies. I, I watch a lot of uh, Facebook reels. Probably shouldn't, but I do. And, and I, get, I, get, uh, I get surprised by the conflicts that people have with each other. Neighbors. And, and we've just, we've just my, my wife, she likes to watch the news. She, she loves to read news stories. And, and she'll say, somebody got shot in a McDonald's because they got a medium fry instead of a large. Now, that really happened. Isn't that the stupidest thing you've ever heard? It's all stupid until it happens to us. <laughs> Amen. It's all stupid until somebody cuts off us off in traffic. It's all, it's all dumb until uh, somebody shorts us a pickle on our Big, Big Mac. It's all, uh, it's all stupid until my family gets out of sorts with each other and we just decide we're not going to talk to one another anymore. It's all stupid until it happens to us. And the Lord Jesus Christ, in all of his love and all of his mercy and all of his grace, he wants us to extend peace and have peace with others. 
He wants us to have peace with those who let their dogs do their business in our yard. Amen. He, he wants us to have peace with those who are going too slow down the highway. He wants us to have peace with those who really, really do cause us conflict and chaos. He wants us to remember these are the sons and daughters of the Most High God. The book of Hebrews says, Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. We need to make every effort to extend peace or have peace with our neighbors and even our enemies. And Romans 12, 18 says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Wow. That'll preach. Amen. <laughs> that'll, that'll convict us. Live at peace with everybody. Well, finally, let me just wrap up by saying, and I haven't, I haven't said this enough over these weeks, but all the things that we talk about in Advent, hope, faith, joy, peace, are meant for us not only to receive, but to extend to others. And the Bible says that blessed are the peacemakers. We are to be peacemakers. We're to help people get over their conflicts. We're to help people get to a place of peace in their own lives. And I would hope and trust that at Christmas, we would not only recognize that Jesus gives us peace, but what he gives us, he expects us to help others with, to give to others. The praise team's going to come back in a moment, and, uh, and as they come, and I'm going to come and give a blessing, but uh, as they come, I, I just want to ask you these questions. Have you made peace with God? Genuinely, have you received his son, Jesus, into your life? If not, today is the right day to do so. For many of us who have received him, we, we still don't have real peace. We, um, we're in conflict with others. We have difficulties in our relationships. And, um, and I just want to ask you today, could you, before you left this building, just bow your head and whisper a prayer, God, help me to have peace about this relationship. Help me to have peace with my neighbors and my enemies or even members of my own family. And then finally, let me ask you, do you have peace about your past, about your weaknesses, about your frailties, about your difficulties? God, even in this place, can begin to hear your prayer for peace. May it be so. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, praise God, we can have peace. Amen. Let's stand together. Oh, holy night. Brightly shine, it is the night of a near Savior's birth. Long veil of the world, it's in an order Oh, yeah.
this law is love, and this gospel is peace. Yeah. Chains shall he break, for a slave is a of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep equip you with every good for doing his will and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ to him be glory forever and ever and the church said amen God bless you be very friendly we'll see you next weekend it's going to be a great time. You're dismissed.